Before we start, uh, let me announce some housekeeping rules and please switch your phones to silent mode. And today we have the honor to have with us senior research fellow, Mr. Zhang Yansheng. Uh, if you are following economic theories, you wouldn't feel strange to this uh, name because uh, Zhang's theories and proposals have been adopted by policymakers. He also has very precise understanding and interpretation of some of the policies of the country. Uh, his interpretation of the policy is a very important reference to local level decision makers as well. So Mr. Zhang is here today in Ningbo. He just arrived last night. He said he's been here many times, but each time he comes here, he feels differently. And we hope that today Mr. Zhang can bring us some of, of his uh, understanding about Ningbo. So the CGTN team has been in Ningbo for a couple of days. We sat down with entrepreneurs here. We visited uh, some uh, champion enterprises. We also uh, went to some of the small and medium-sized enterprises, and we took a look at the business environment here. And we also had the conversation with um, entrepreneurs that are of the uh, Generation Y and Generation Z. And we talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, and they believe that Ningbo is a place with very good people, a very beautiful environment, and great potential. So we feel that there is an atmosphere of going up. There is a spirit of challenging all the difficulties ahead of us. And this, I believe, is the spirit of Ningbo. And this is a gene that is deeply planted in the blood and bones of Ningbo people. So John, uh, just arrived here last night, and he told me that over the past 30 years, Ningbo has focused on developing private enterprises, on opening the economy, and also on developing industrialization. And what are the stories that the city will tell in the next 30 years? Will Ningbo continue to rely on an external economy and rely on the maritime economy. Without further ado, let's put our hands together and give it up for Mr. Zhang Yansheng, Chief Research Fellow from China Center of International Economic and Exchanges. Mr. Zhang, the floor is yours. Thank you very much to the moderator. And good morning to all the friends sitting here. It's a great pleasure coming to Ningbo again. It's a great pleasure seeing all the friends again. And to all the friends who are following the development of Ningbo, uh, today is a chance to uh, hear the story of Ningbo's development. And today, we want to decode the secret of Ningbo's high quality economic development. First, the first question we have to ask is what kind of city is Ningbo? Ningbo, as you know, is a renowned city for business, and that is known across the world. And Ningbo is located along China's eastern coast. It is located in the uh, southern part of the Yangtze River Delta. Uh, it, it was in here that uh, the Hemudu culture was originated 7,000 years ago. And Ningbo is also an economic center in the south of the Yangtze River Delta. 
So Ningbo is of critical importance to the Yangtze River Delta, to China, as well as to the world. And it has very frequent business connections with the rest of part of the world. So in our standards, Ningbo is a associate provincial capital city. In China, if a city is a associate provincial capital city, then the city has a lot of uh, mandate to uh, formulate regulations and laws for the locality. And it is also of critical importance to facilitating local area development. And Ningbo has the right to formulate a lot of the local laws and regulations. And we always say that we need to leverage the legislative power of different localities. So here in Ningbo, the city has the power to legislate laws and regulations. And Ningbo is also a famous city in China from a historic and cultural perspective. So industry and business have always been a business card of Ningbo. As the moderator has said earlier, the Ningbo spirit. So the Ningbo spirit was formulated in modern China. So this is a spirit that has evolved from the past to present, and it will evolve into the future. In the mid-19th century, the local banks in Ningbo here developed a accounting system. And that is to say that settlements of uh, capital do not need to rely on cash. And you could wear the payment through different banks without carrying the cash to different banks. And there is a uniform accounting system amongst the, the banks in Ningbo. So this is a symbol marking the transformation of Ningbo from modern to contemporary China. So in history, you know that the banks in Zhejiang were very famous. And also the banks in Shanxi province were also very famous. So you can see that from a geological perspective, Ningbo has become a famous city in industry and business in China, as well as in the world. You can actually trace back to history. Because in history, and there was a period of time when Ningbo was a financial center and also a center for the financial industry. As long as we have a seed, we will be able to obtain the harvest. Now if we look at the city, as of last year, it has a permanent population of more than 9.4 million. So this is pretty close to 10 million. It's a max city, and it takes an area of uh, 9,816 uh, 9, uh, square kilometers. And last year, the GDP of Ningbo reached 1.2408 trillion RMB, and the per capita GDP of the city exceeded 13 trillion, uh, 13, uh, 130,000 yuan. So uh, it's uh, supported by three key industries of uh, petrochemical, textile, and uh, machine uh, manufacturing. So today, we always say that in 2020, China has gone through an extraordinary year. And we see that because last year, in 2020, well, China managed to solve a problem that has been troubling China for thousands of years, and that is absolute poverty. And that has been well resolved, and China um, built a moderately prosperous society last year. And in 2021, this year, and we believe this is a very important year in the process of 
building China's modernization drive. In 2021, we are going to embark on a new journey of China's modernization drive. We are going to travel a journey of common prosperity. And that is to say that we are going to share the common benefit of opening up and reform, and we are going to dramatically improve people's living standards. And I always say that the last 40 years have ended, and we are now embarking on a journey of another three decades. Against this backdrop, Zhejiang province and Ningbo city Drensley initiated the program of building a demonstration zone for common prosperity. And in this process, Ningbo will definitely become the uh, trailblazer. The common prosperity demonstration zone has the target of increasing its per capita GDP to the level of uh, moderately developed countries by 2025. And we know that in 2020, the per capita GDP actually exceeded $20,000. So in reality, Ningbo ranks on top of the other uh, localities in common prosperity, and it also carries the target that by 2035, the per capita GDP and uh, per capita resident income could reach the level of developed economies. So I believe that Ningbo will pioneer in all the cities in Zhejiang in achieving these targets. So what significance can we make from here? And here you can take a look at this chart. And this is a recap from a historical um, perspective. And you can see that 200 years ago, in 1820, the GDP of China accounted for 32.9% of the global total. And that is to say that when you move 200 years back, China was the most developed country in the world. And we can look at the United States 200 years ago. In 1820, the economy of the US only accounted for 1.8% of the world's total. And that is less than 1 50th of that of China. So you can see that over the past 200 years, how the United States moved from an emerging power to a modern power. And over the past 200 years, China drifted from the most powerful country in the world to a period of decline, to humiliation. And then over the past 70 years, since the People's Republic of China was founded, China traveled back on a journey of rejuvenation. And if you look by PPP, or Purchasing Power Parity, according to the data from World Bank in 2014, China already surpassed the United States. And if you judge by the standard of uh, currency exchange rates, and we believe that in 2030, we're going to surpass the GDP of the US. So the rejuvenation of China, 2021 will mark a very important year for China's modernization drive, because that will mark the beginning of another very important three decades. And at this point of time, we have to have a recap of history, how over the past four decades, people in Ningbo created a miracle through reform and opening up. As the host has mentioned earlier, that yesterday in our conversation, I said that the past 40 years in Ningbo, people here focused on telling three stories or on three key priorities. The first is we focused on market-oriented economy. Now, over the past 40 years, Ningbo has traveled 
an extraordinary journey in developing market economy, and I witnessed that personally. I remember at the beginning years of opening up and reform, I paid a visit to Ningbo. I was accompanied by the then uh, leaders of Ningbo, and they told me that people in Ningbo believed that as long as it is allowed by market economy, the government will not interfere. As long as the market economy falls short in performing in certain areas, then the responsibilities of the government would pitch in. And over the past 40 years, I remember visiting a small shop in Ningbo, and I saw that the goods sold there were very cheap. I asked the boss of the shop, why you set the price so low? And he told me that the government said, we are just small vendors, and we are still at the early stage of uh, being cultivated. So that is why the government had a preferential tax policy. So we just pay some minimal tax. So the government was uh, flooding water into the pond to feed the fish. And by that, I mean all those uh, small businesses. So gradually, step by step, with 40 years, Ningbo is able to allow market resources to play a central role in allocating the resources of the society. So over the past, uh, over the past 40 years, uh, another big priority of Ningbo is to focus on an outward-looking economy. So over the past 40 years, there were two drivers for Ningbo's economy. One of the wheels is export. And by export, we're not simply selling our commodities and services to the global market. And most importantly, we have to take a ride of the globalization that is taking place in the world. Another a very important wheel is bringing business from elsewhere to Ningbo. So why we have to attract investment? So at the beginning years of opening up and reform, China was in a shortage of capital and foreign exchanges. So we have to bring in foreign capital. We have to bring in foreign currencies. And most importantly, through those external investments, we are bringing in competition factors from the outside, which facilitated the development of the market economy here in Ningbo. So another story that Ningbo told very well is the process of industrialization. Over the past 40 years, in particular in 1978, the Angles uh, index was 60%. Uh, so that is to see that 60% of people's income were spent on food and clothing. So you can see that this is very backward. At least in 20 years after China initiated the reform and opening up policy, China was struggling to feed ourselves well. And so that is why in the first 20 years of China's opening up and reform, China registered very fast development in light, industri light industries. And in 2020, and that parameter reduced to 40%. And that is to say that people are well fed and well closed. And after that, people started to, to um, buy homes, buy cars, and buy cell phones. So. Starting from 2000, when the Gini's parameter reduced to 40%, Ningbo started to focus on the building industry, the construction sector. And in 2012, things started to change in Ningbo because after 2012, in particular, by 2019, the uh, Angus uh, index was lower than 30%. So 
So when people are living a good life, people study to focus on entertainment, on tourism, on information. So you can see that life-related services and production-related services and also public services have generated a huge demand from the market. And these demands have pushed the economic restructuring of Ningbo. Last year, we built a moderately prosperous society and we have resolved the problem of absolute poverty. And starting from this year, we are going to embark on a new journey. In the next 30 years, I believe that in that new state, we are going to tell three new stories very well. The first story is the story of innovation. So talking about innovation, you have to first and foremost embrace science, basic research, and original innovation. So what is the platform supporting this? And that is universities, universities for research purposes. So in the next 30 years, Ningbo has to focus on universities. And we have to build a number of universities that focuses on research because they can support the development of the city in the next 30 years. Then we also have to embrace basic researches. We have to empower research organizations and institutions. And we have to embrace those fields of science and research that can be applied. And we have to engage in those key technologies. And we also need to focus on some shared technologies for application purposes. And we have to put enterprises at the very center and allow the market to play a dominant role in supporting technologies. So for Ningbo, the next 30 years has to focus on innovation. Another story we have to tell very well in the next 30 years is legislation. By telling the stories, I mean we have to focus on those things and we have to focus on rules, principles, management standards, and we have to uh, standardize all this so that we can be well connected with the world. In the next 30 years, when you come to Ningbo, uh, you will see that Ningbo is the city that is well governed. Uh, when you go to enterprises, and you will see that all the enterprises, they are running very well in good standards. So this, I believe, is very important for Ningbo. So we have to leverage the local rights in legislation. So to be specific, there are 500 public service categories closely related to people's lives. And we have to explore a legal structure that features legislation, law enforcement, and also regulation. And we need to have uh, oversight. We need to have a regulatory system. We need to have a mechanism that allows the leaders from different areas to report their duties on an annual basis. And if we could have all this, you will transform Ningbo into a modern city governed by the rule of law. And another key priority in the next 30 years is common prosperity. And common prosperity is a world-class difficulty market economy could solve issues related to efficiency. Uh, how should socialist, uh, socialist market economy could solve the problem of social equity? So the journey towards common prosperity or commonwealth is a world-class difficulty or challenge. So Ningbo is standing at a new starting point. 
You can take a look at my slide. And this is a chart indicating the uh, predictions of IMF about the world economy. According to the IMF, this year, the average uh, growth of the world economy will amount to 6%. And there are two drivers for that. One is China, of course. According to IMF, this year, China's GDP will grow by 8.4%. Another driver of the global economy is the U.S. The U.S. economy this year is expected to grow at 6.4%. Four, but these two drivers are hugely different. And last year, China's economy grew by 4%. At a time, uh, in the meantime, China introduced the least stimulus packages. And uh, if you look at the United States, it's introduced the biggest stimulus packages amongst all the countries. So we have to ask a question. For the world economy and world trade to increase, so where does the momentum come from? Will this momentum be sustained? I personally believe that there are three points of realities for the world economy. Number one, globalization is shrinking. And this is a basic reality we have to admit. And global trade and investment is slowing down. And this is another reality. And global supply chain and the industrial chain is being reshaped. And this is yet another basic reality. So for Ningbo, in the next 30 years, how should we advance globalization? How should we facilitate the new type of globalization? So we have to focus on the macro, digital, and innovation-driven globalization. We have to advance globalization with all these three factors. And we should facilitate cross-border e-commerce, trading services, digital services, digital trade, green trade, and also offshore trade so that we can dramatically advance global trade. We are using big data, cloud computing, industrial IoT to formulate a new industrial chain and supply chain so that we can continue make important headways. And that is to see that in the future, the supply chain and industrial chain will be much shorter they will be much more localized, and they will be much more value-centered, and they will be focusing more on safety and security, and they will be focusing more on putting your own country's interests first. So against this backdrop, Ningbo should use digital technologies, modern services, and smart city brains to build a more elastic, more resilient, city that can meet the needs of the supply chain and industrialized chain that is more customized. So in the next 30 years, be it the international environment and also the changing global situation, you can see that there are drastic changes and this is what I need to share with you. Another very important question I want to focus is openness. And I believe this is what underlies the development of uh, Ningbo. And from China's Tang and Song dynasty, Ningbo has been a very important foreign trade port of the country. The Zhoushan port in Ningbo tops the world in terms of uh, cargo capacity or container capacity ranks third globally. So for Ningbo, we are building a, a metropolitan circle and that includes Ningbo, Zhoushan and Taizhou, these three cities. In the next step, we are going to build a city circle and that will be 
a global and modern comprehensive port, and that will be a international airline service base and also international trade and logistics center and a major strategic point for China's Belt and Road Initiative. So for Ningbo, going into the future, we have to build higher level open economy. We have to build a new economic system for that. And what is that? So we have to focus on advancing market openness. So for Ningbo, no matter it is the uh, tariff rate, non-tariff rates, and also trade facilitation and efficiencies of custom clearance or market entry of the service sector, Ningbo will become only more open in all these categories so that we can mobilize all the different resource factors so they can flow uh, freely and efficiently in a convenient manner. And secondly, we also need to deliver open systems. So that is to say that for whatever system and mechanism that we are talking about in Ningbo, we have to engage in innovation. We have to make them open, and we have to benchmark with the most open cities in the world. Another sector we have to be open is innovation. Innovation must be open so that we can bring talents from everywhere. We can bring knowledge from everywhere to Ningbo. We need to open our arms for innovation, for sharing, for talent attraction. So against this backdrop, the Zhoushan part of Ningbo has to uh, engage more in expanding new uh, maritime routes along the Belgian Road Initiative, as long as there is the part of uh, the countries along the Belgian Road Initiative, there will be a port run by a person from Ningbo. So we have to build a open network that features free flow of information, goods, and services. On the other hand, we also need to build Ningbo into a highland of international um, cargo and uh, passenger aviation, and also build a service network for international aviation so that Ningbo could become a major window for international flows of talent, capital, information, and other high-end high factors and elements. Another very important aspect is to advance the coordinated development between the Zhoushan port, the Shanghai port, as well as the Lianyuangang port, because Zhoushan port right now ranks on top of the world in terms of uh, scattered goods uh, capacity. So in the next step, Ningbo will coordinate its development with Shanghai port as well as Lianyuangang port so that we can build a world-class cluster of ports. And by that, we can build a free trade port. In the next step, we have to understand that the fundamental purpose for our development is to meet people's needs for better lives. China has gone through a journey of 40 years of reform and opening up. We have had three generations of people, and as the moderator has said that she had conversations with the Generation Y and Generation Z in Ningbo. And for Generation Y and Generation Z, according to the US Business Magazine, and they found out that the millennials in China and the millennials and the Generation Z in Ningbo, they are the most optimistic uh, people about the future. So that is why I say that those that can meet the needs of the new generation in China for a better life will become the next big thing in the future. If you could meet the needs of these young children, you have to rely not just on the Chinese brain or Chinese wisdom, 
we have to build a world brain. So the millennials and the generation Y of China, they will change the world, they will change China, and they will change the world. I found out that the Generation Y and Generation Z of uh, Ningbo, those who are still uh, studying at middle school, when they are choosing a major in college, they tend to choose science and technology. And they do that not because they want to make a fortune, not because they want to find a good job after graduation, not because they want to feed their family well, because they are inherently passionate about science. So from the new generation of people in Ningbo, I see the hope of science in China. I believe that the spring of science in China is coming to us. Against this backdrop, so you can see that Ningbo is trying all it can to meet people's needs for better lives. And Ningbo is building a world-class city circles and smart cities so that Ningbo can advance its high-quality development. So Ningbo is uh, building its uh, life service uh, industry and that covers culture, tourism, and entertainment, and also production-related services such as uh, R&D services, information services, design services, and also public service industry. And that includes education, public health, old age care. So all these sectors and categories, and they will become a key pillar supporting the development of Ningbo in the future. So in the uh, metropolitan uh, circle of Ningbo, they focus on the aggregation of all these sectors, and they focus on the transportation networks and logistic uh, systems, and they focus more on the uh, cross-border e-commerce network connecting Ningbo to the whole world. So I believe that in doing so, Ningbo will be transformed into a green city, a livable city, an open city, an inclusive city, and a smart city. So Ningbo will be able to bring and gather those global elites and talents. For the next part, I would like to talk about the advantages of Ningbo, and that is innovation. You can see that Ningbo is the pioneer in Zhejiang's initiative of building a common prosperity demonstration zone. So uh, you can see that uh, Zhejiang is currently focusing on building a high-level, national-level demonstration zone for independent innovation, and that is focusing on Hangzhou and Ningbo. And Ningbo is building a modern logistic system to promote the coordination between the seaport, the land port, the uh, airport, as well as the information ports. In the meantime, Ningbo is eliminating all the barriers hampering the development of private uh, sectors. And Ningbo is also um, breaking down the barriers, such as uh, the Huiko policy, the um, identity of people, the uh, gender barriers, and also the uh, geological barriers in job employment. In the meantime, Ningbo is dramatically improving people's income, and it's expanding its middle class. So with this in mind, by 20, uh, in 2020, the research uh, investment in Ningbo accounts for 2.85% of its economy, and we believe that by 2025, this figure will be increased to 3.6 percent. And by 2025, Ningbo will be built into a highland of new material, industrial internet, and also core and key basic 
technologies. So we have to focus on innovation, on basic research, applied technologies, and also experimental uh, technologies so that we can facilitate the high quality development of Ningbo. So people in Ningbo are taking actions already. So you can see that Ningbo ranks on top of the country in terms of champion enterprises in the manufacturing sector. And Ningbo is also ranking on top of other cities in China in terms of the net inflow of talents. So from this perspective, you can see that in the next step, Ningbo will focus primarily on innovation-driven development. And that will become the number one driving force of Ningbo going forward. From a national um, perspective, you can see that we also focus on promoting innovation-driven development and developing a modern industrial system. Over the past five years, China has been dramatically increasing its R&D investments. Uh, if you look at all those uh, localities in China, that figure has been growing at more than 10% each and every year. And last year, China spent 2.46 trillion yuan in research and development. Uh, how about five years later? In five years, I believe that will surpass a 3.78 trillion yuan in terms of R&D spending. So that is to say that over the past five years, China has spent uh, more than 10% of money each and every year in investment. So that is unprecedented in Chinese history. Uh, this will form an enormous uh, momentum or driving force for China's technological innovation. So technological innovation will be able to push our economy forward in this new era. Now let's take a look at the output or the results. And last year, you can take a look at all the different patterns that were, uh, that were registered last year. Let's just take a look at one. Last year, the increase of uh, effective invention patents grow significantly and by 42.6%, and that is the most important parameter. And you can take a look at the chart. And last year, it grew by 18.8% compared to the previous year, and that is the effective patent of the invention here domestically in China. So this is very close to 20%. So China today has traveled to a very important crossroad of uh, innovation-driven developments. And in 2020, Ningbo uh, had uh, two national level entrepreneurial technological centers, and Ningbo has built two uh, demonstration um, bases for mass innovation and entrepreneurship by all. And Ningbo invested in 1,023 enterprises of high tech, and it has made uh, important breakthroughs in 116 core technologies. So you can see that. Ningbo is in a very good shape in this very important category. If you look at the whole country, you can see that China, in the next step, in my personal view, is that China will uh, transition from the old momentum to new momentums. Uh, traditionally, we were basically relying on hard work, but in the future, that will be featuring uh, wisdom, and we are transitioning from the uh, labor-intensive to technology-intensive uh, economy. The old economic pattern is being replaced by the new economic pattern. You can just look at one parameter, and that is the social spending, that is the proportion of social spending on R&D to GDP. You can see that in China, 
There are three very different uh, sectors. There are six provinces in China that are higher than OECD countries in terms of uh, technological investment. We have 12 provinces in China that are still in a process of investment-driven economy. And we have uh, 13 countries that are still in a phase of uh, resource-driven development. So you can see that in China, we are a miniature of the world, and we have three different uh, stages of development across different provinces. So in China, we are going to solve unbalanced and unequal uh, development. And that is very crucial to China's high quality development. And that is why China is focusing on high quality and common prosperity uh, demonstration zone. And that is why this is uh, this demonstration zone is built in Zhejiang and in Ningbo in particular. And Ningbo is in the first category, of course. And Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, Zhejiang, Jiangsu, and Zhejiang these are the um, trailblazers in China's development, and Ningbo is standing at the center of spotlight in this first category. And Ningbo is uh, given a lot of responsibilities, uh, a lot of tasks in China's innovation-driven development. So we hope that in the next 30 years, Ningbo can make important headways in transitioning our momentum, structure, and development model. So Ningbo. We hope that it can make important breakthroughs in a new era, because we have just kick-started another development journey of 30 years. We're standing at the new starting point, so we have a lot of expectations for the development of Ningbo. So that's all from my sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhang, for giving us such wonderful uh, sharing. And it's only 40 minutes. I didn't uh, remind uh, about the timing, but you did it very well. And Mr. Zhang talked a lot about how we can pioneer in common prosperity. Uh, Mr. Zhang shared with a lot of uh, substantial and practical uh, suggestions, and we have to build a advanced a manufacturing circle and also a metropolitan circle. I visited the uh, Joshan port. I even climbed on the operating council of the Queen Towers, and I know that they have changed this uh, remote control. I also compared that to the uh, conventional way of operation, and you talked about the airport, land port, and sea port, and also information port. And you talked about how to break through the um, barriers in system, and we have to eliminate the barriers of uh, hukou and gender barriers. And in the final part of your presentation, you focused on research spendings, and this is very core, and this is very crucial for the future development of Ningbo. So this is a fantastic sharing, and thank you so very much for your presentation. So Mr. Zhang is still uh, standing on the stage, and now let's uh, give the floor to our audience here. And if you have any questions, you can raise your hand, and we'll pass you a mic. All right. Mr. Zhang, it's such a great pleasure. I come from the Development Research Institute of Ningbo. So Zhejiang is now building a national level common prosperity demonstration zone, and Ningbo is a key in that initiative. So my question is, building the Ningbo a city circle, uh, what significance do you make in advancing the high quality development in this region? Thank you so very much for your question. We know that in the next step, the new type of urbanization will be featuring metropolitan circles. In the Yangtze River economic delta, China will build the world class city circles, and there are five city circles in that area. We have the Ningbo city circle, Hangzhou city circle, Nanjing city circle. And Su Qichang uh, City Circle, and also Hefei City Circle. These are the five uh, city circles. 
in the Yangtze River Delta. And one of the most important policy transitions is to deregulation and de-administration. So in Ningbo, Zhoushan, and Taizhou, we are going to build an area that complies with market principles and market rules. And that goes to land, talent, capital, technology, and data, and all the uh, production elements and factors. And those factors, they will be allocated in market-oriented rules and principles so that we will eliminate the administrative uh, interferences. And traditionally, we focus only on land, on our own administrative uh, jurisdictions. But in the future, the city circle will have more uh, smooth uh, flows of information and different production factors across different cities. So I believe that the basic infrastructure will be further developed. I believe you will build a one-hour uh, life circle or commute circle. I believe you will have uh, 300 kilometers range of highways and also 150 uh, kilometers of uh, expressway network, and you will build a cross-city uh, subway system and also public transportation system. So you will find out that in this process, Ningbo stands at the very center. In the CBD area, I believe you will have a half an hour commute circle. In the overall Ningbo city circle, you will have a one hour commute circle. So everything here will be very fast, very efficient, so, so that people can save a lot of their times. Another very important area is that you can complement the advantages of different ports, and that includes the ports in Ningbo and Zhoushan. In the future, they will be more integrated. As I said earlier, it will be further connected to Shanghai port and Lianyungang port. So the port in Jiangsu province and in Shanghai and also in Ningbo, they will form a integrated port. I believe that the Ningbo economic circle will play a very important role also in maritime transportation. So we talked about this, this uh, uh, multi node uh, transportation, including airport, uh, land port, and also uh, information port. Uh, that will also um, generate a lot of new sectors, for example, the registration of uh, ships, the insurance of different transportation means. So you will form a high-end business service uh, category. Another very important area is trade. So there will be more goods and commodities. The volume will become uh, just gigantic, but the per unit uh, volume of these goods will be smaller. Uh, so Ningbo will become more um, poised towards uh, green trade, digital trade, and also new type of trade, and in particular, trade that are uh, in the uh, cross-border e-commerce. So I believe that Ningbo will be a very important hub for international trade. The fourth prospect is that Ningbo will be built into a very important supporting point for the Belt and Road Initiative. So we're going to leverage our advantages in ports, in industries, in finance, so we can formulate a comprehensive logistic support center. So we will be playing a central role in supporting China's Belt and Road Initiative. And last but not least, I hope that in this uh, Ningbo uh, city circle, we can build an international technological innovation center so that we can support basic researches, so that we can empower uh, research universities for basic researches. 
and experimental researches that can facilitate innovation-driven development. And we can empower a lot of leading enterprises, which will in turn feed back to the urbanization of Ningbo and the construction of the Ningbo city circles. Thank you very much for your question. Do we have another question? Professor Zhang, I'm a research fellow from the Ningbo Development Research uh, Academy. I thank you very much for giving us such great presentation. And you talked about one key word, openness. So Ningbo, since ancient times, has been an important port in China. It's also an important city in China's opening up and reform drive. Uh, what kind of role will Ningbo play in a new era going forward? As I said earlier, over the past 40 years, uh, over the past 70 years since the new China was founded, uh, throughout the thousands of years in China's history, Ningbo has been a very open city. And what is open? Number one, it means open-minded. So the man side of Ningbo is very open. And with open man side, Ningbo has this uh, global vision. And Ningbo has this concept of market economy. And Ningbo has this concept of uh, rule of law and innovation-driven development. So from the openness journey of Ningbo, you can see that when we say open, it's not just you know physically opening your door, and it's opening your mind. So when I was here uh, last night, uh, I was told that people in Ningbo we look at the whole world as our home, and we do not simply confine our steps within our doorsteps. So what is openness? Openness is the boldness to dance with the wolves. We're not fearful of competition, and we dare to compete. And the essence of openness lies in the innovative openness and reform of our mechanisms and systems. And you can see that over the past 40 years, we have made a lot of change in our systems and mechanisms. So what is the momentum of openness? And that is the risks and challenges and difficulties. And we talk about the world facing enormous changes in 100 years. And we talk about we need to bear in mind both China and the world and focus on China primarily. So. In this process, Ningbo has accumulated a lot of experiences and practices suitable for its own development. Going forward, I believe Ningbo will build a higher level open economy and a higher level economic system. So what is that? My understanding is that the market will be more open, our systems will become more open, uh, innovation will become more open. So from this perspective, you can think about the commodities and services, and they will become more open. And the most important is the systems. We talked about the openness of management, uh, standards, and um, principles. So if we can open our systems, we can dramatically connect to that of the world. So Ningbo, in Ningbo, people here have a broad vision. And we have to build a international chain that supports global collaboration in science and technology. And we, Ningbo, become the source of uh, research outsourcing of the world. And we, we give research tasks to scientists from all over the world. If we could do that, we're going to build a cross-border innovation network. So together with talents from elsewhere, we can make important breakthroughs in science and technology. And this is a tug of war. And there are some countries in the world that are advocating decoupling. 
So we as people in Ningbo, we have to unite all the forces in the world so that build, we can build a open network of collaboration. So we are standing at the new starting point of history. We have to further open our mindset. Thank you very much. Um, because of time constraints, uh, let's uh, ask one final question. So I will be very short. Professor Zhang, good morning. I'm from the Ningbo Development Research Academy. Uh, in your presentation, you said that Ningbo will be built into a national common prosperity demonstration center. You said that Ningbo will trailblaze uh, this initiative. Uh, one of the key is to narrow the gap of uh, between rural and urban areas. And what are the measures that do you think that can dramatically improve people's income in the rural areas? Zero rejuvenation is a very important part for this common prosperity uh, national demonstration zone in Ningbo. According to my research and surveys, I believe that over the past 40 years, Ningbo has traveled an extraordinary journey in industrialization. Much of that had to do with those township enterprises, and gradually they became uh, private enterprises. At the very beginning, they were just rural uh, cooperatives or township enterprises. Uh, eventually, they become private enterprises. Bear in mind that at the very beginning, those were enterprises established in villages, and they have dramatically advanced the industrialization of villages. I have a friend who obtained a PhD from a famous university in the U.S. in chemistry. And 10 years ago, he brought the research team of a top 500 enterprise in the world and brought them to Zhejiang. And they visited and they settled down in a village level enterprise. So, He's a Chinese, but he's leading a team of research consisting of uh, white people, and they are settled down here in China, in Ningbo. And now there are new batches of white researchers uh, from European countries, from the U.S., and they are settling down here in Ningbo. I have done a lot of research on that, and they said that in the European market, they have already studied com to compete with uh, multinational companies in other countries. And in that village, I see a lot of research teams in from the United States, and in that enterprise, I also saw a Japanese team of quality management. In the meantime, they have professional managers that are leading the uh, marketing and sales team of the company. I won't mention the name of the enterprise, but that enterprise is still located in a village. But each and every year, its sales revenue exceeds more than 10 billion, and its uh, products are well sold across the international market. So it's truly a very competitive enterprise in the world. So talking about rural rejuvenation, uh, rejuvenation, what comes to my mind is that those enterprises built in the 1970s, and 1980s, and 1990s, at that time, those were just like sparkles, uh, sparks at different uh, villages. And those are just like you know chimneys from uh, village houses. At that time, they were exploring the pattern of uh, land utilization. At the time, I was thinking, how could these enterprises transform their development pattern? Uh, here in Ningbo, in Zhejiang, in many places of the country, you've seen that those enterprises have traveled a journey of revolution. So this revolution was originated from rural industrialization. Uh, over the past 40 years, 
those uh, rural enterprises and the uh, transitioning to high quality development and the uh, giving back their land and the uh, integrating their resources, they are laying a solid foundation for embracing high-end manufacturing industry and also production related services uh, so that the uh, leaving uh, more uh, space for potential developments going forward uh, that space can be used to trigger even greater developments in digital trade and digital economy so from this perspective, I'm very optimistic about rural rejuvenation because I saw a lot of rural cooperatives and township enterprises and they are deeply involved in China's um, first and second and tertiary industry. And those enterprises originated from villages and towns and counties, they are right now changing the overall landscape. Uh, when I was uh, inspecting these enterprises, I found out that these enterprises, they are quickly transitioning, and that has led to improved income of the residents with their lands. And when the land was uh, renovated, those farmers they could take the dividend. And that is the only conducive to rural development. And recently, there is a very important policy from the state level, and that is the that is related to the uh, land lease fee of uh, the local governments. And for land lease, the fee will be also collected by tax authorities at the local level of the government, and also 50% uh, of that will be used on agriculture, on farmers, as well as on the rural area. So this is a very encouraging piece of news. So coordination and green development and openness and sharing, those are important pathways for future development. Uh, these policies are conducive to rural uh, rejuvenation going forward, and they will be very conducive to narrowing the wealth gap between rural and urban areas. And if you look at the wealth gap currently between rural and urban areas, and right now it stands at somewhere between 2.56 nationally. In Zhejiang, it's 1.96. In Ningbo, it's only 1.74. So, for the first time in history, Zhejiang is having a rural and urban wealth gap that is below 2. In Ningbo, it's only 1.74. And that can be attributed to the enormous development of rural enterprises over the past 40 years. Going forward, how can we further transform this enterprise um, in line with the high quality uh, development. I believe these enterprises in Ningbo will explore a new pathway. It will help contribute more practices and experience and solutions to the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Zhang. You shared a lot of the very meaningful practices, and you talked about the rural enterprise and a lot of the examples that you share are from the surveys that you have conducted over the years. I apologize, I apologize for spending too much time than I planned. So this is a a lecture a series on decoding the secret of uh, cities. And uh, in the future, if we have chances, we can bring you to other uh, lectures. And traditionally, if you want to hear uh, Professor Zhang, you have to go to those uh, very high-end uh, seminars or lectures. And of course, this one is also very uh, high-end. Uh, but in the future, you don't need to go to those uh, close-the-door seminars. And you can meet Professor Zhang right here in our program. So let's give it up for uh, Mr. Zhang. Thank you very much. All right, so this is the end of today's program.
Thank you very much, and stay tuned on our program on decoding the secret of uh, Mac cities. We'll bring you to more cities in the future. Thank you very much.